Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan Energy Man here in Think Tech Hawaii. And um, I'm glad to be here today. Um, glad to be here today on a beautiful day in Honolulu. Uh, we're going to be talking to special guests that I haven't had on for about a year, but um, he's from the island of Kauai. We just call him Big Ben because we think he's about six foot ten or something like that. Anyway, he dominates the room when he comes in, but he's a great heart for clean energy and is doing great things on the island of Kauai. And it's about time that we caught up with the west end of the state. We've been talking to folks on Maui and the Big Island, but not Kauai lately. So, uh, Mr. Ben Sullivan, who is the Sus Energy and Sustainability Coordinator for the County of Kauai, he's our guest today. And hey, welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you, Stan, the Energy Man. It's great to be back. Yeah. So, uh, tell the audience that hasn't met you before a little bit about yourself and what you do over there in Kauai. Sure. I have um, the great privilege of being the county's energy and sustainability coordinator. I work in the Office of Economic Development for uh, Mayor Derek Kawakami, uh, who just was seated in, into the mayoral office uh, last December, so very exciting. Um, I have been in this position for seven years, so been doing this for quite a while. Um, I, I will say candidly, I never imagined working in government. Um, growing up and going to school and all through my professional career, it just kind of happened. And the evolution was really, I spent years doing architecture, small-scale stuff, some mixed use, and then some um, residential architecture here in Hawaii, and um, became an advocate for renewable energy within the community. And uh, along the course of kind of learning more about our energy challenges and engaging on climate issues and, <coughs> and, and energy supply issues and whatnot, back in, like, say, 2005, 2006, I, I, we did a lot of interfacing with the community as a grassroots group, or I'm sorry, with the utility as a grassroots group, and we were always kind of pounding the table saying, how can we do more renewable energy? And at the time, it was really difficult. They didn't know. Um, so I got, got tired of being on the outside and ran for their board, and um, after a, a couple of tries, was elected to their board of directors. We're lucky that we have a co-op over here, so that was uh, quite an experience for me. So I spent three years learning a little bit about the complex world of utilities and, and learning from a, a really a great staff and, and CEO over there about how they, uh, they wanted to move forward. And um, when my term was up, I, this position at the county opened up and I jumped on it. I decided it was a great way to continue public service in the area of energy and sustainability, and, uh, and here I am. Great. Yeah, for the listeners and viewers out there that don't know, the island of Kauai is the only island that we have here in the state that has uh, got a co-op for the electric utility. The rest of the utilities and the rest of the state are uh, all owned by Hawaiian Electric Corporation. So you have Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island and Hiko on Oahu. But Kauai has their own um, co-op. And Ben, could you tell us a little bit about um, the, the co-op over there and uh, how big it is now and how good they're doing? We'll get into some details <laughs> after, the, after the break, but... Um, sure. Yeah, sure, just kind sure, of give sure. us some background. I, yeah, on them. I, think, I think a lot of your viewers are aware, or listeners are aware, of, of how well KIUC is doing. But um, Kauai Island Utility Cooperative was kind of brought into existence in about 2002, 2003. They were previously a for profit corporation, um, Citizens Utilities. I think they were out of Connecticut, is where they were based. And Citizens decided, you know, a few years prior to that, it was time for them to sell. And, uh, the community stepped up, and there was, you know, there's a kind of a longer backstory there that I'll skip. But basically, we ended up with a, a cooperative, which is a, a rural utility cooperative through the national model. There's an organization called the National Rural NRECA, National Rural Electrical Cooperative Association, and <clears throat> so they became a member of that. And um, we, as a community, were given access to uh, rural utility service dollars in order to to do a lot of the financing for the cooperative. And, um, you know, ever since it started, really, we've been trying to figure out what it means to run our own utility. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, still have, a, a, you know, a really, really expert staff of engineers and, and professionals guiding us. But, but basically, what it comes down to is there is a nine-member board of directors who provides guidance to the staff on strategy and, and budget, and, um, and then the staff goes out and executes. So it's a wonderful model. I think we're sitting at about 50% renewable energy. Um, the success they've been having of late is, is solar plus storage projects, so PV, large PV farms with, <clears throat> with big battery banks, and they, the, I can't say enough about how well the engineers and the finance people are doing in terms of making that model work and really bringing down the cost of our electricity stand. 
and stabilizing it in the context of, you know, a lot of other places that are seeing increases. So it's pretty amazing. Well, us, us customers over here on Oahu are jealous. So we'll, uh, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about, um, about that utility after the break. But, uh, you know, let's get caught up a little bit on what you've been doing around town in Lehui and um, things like bicycle lanes and pedestrian ways and things like that. Because last time you were on the show, we, we spent quite a bit of time uh, and those projects were just getting started under, I think, a Tiger Grant or something like that. Can you catch us up? Sure. So we had just been through the process um, of applying for and successfully being awarded that Tiger Grant. Um, there's a huge caveat here, which is to say I am, I'm kind of a, in the peanut gallery as far as this transportation and mode shift stuff goes. If you remember, Stan, we had a wonderful guest on with me last time uh, in the person of Marie Williams, who is one of our long-range planners. So herself and Lee Steinmetz and a bunch of other folks in the planning department have done an incredible job over the last few years, along with our public works department, really rethinking the way that we design and build out our streetscape. And so much so that they've got community advocacy groups and policy changes and, and really a, a robust ecosystem of people working to, to make a paradigm shift is what I think it comes down to. Um, the Tiger Grant in Lihui, the Lihui Town Tour Revitalization, is a, is a culmination of a lot of that, and really the first major project that I think you'll see this kind of physical implementation um, across a whole town area as opposed to just a single interve intervention. The status of that project is it's just going under construction. So as everybody knows, you know, government process takes a long time. Um, there was a whole lot of planning to get the award. There was a whole lot of engineering that has gone in since then and community process in terms of the specifics of that project and, you know, the contract has been awarded and the construction actually has already started in small part, but some of the bigger pieces are going to be starting uh, fairly soon this year. So very exciting time for us, uh, a lot of activity. So what are, what are some of the specific projects you're working on in Lihui there then? Um, you know, are you like getting rid of one way or putting in one way streets and changing traffic around or are you just widening sidewalks or what, what are some of the projects that you're working on? And again, the planning department gets all the credit here. Can't say that enough. But but um, you know the the folks that are that have designed this project put a lot of thought into basically just saying, hey, how do we make Lihui Town itself more appealing to everybody who uses the street as opposed to just an automobile? And so yes, there's been some um, conversion of two way to one way streets in some cases where it made sense and where it alleviated traffic and other you know pressure points. There's um, the Rice Street, which is the major thoroughfare downtown in the old part of town, is going is, to, I think they're, you, you, the term uh, road diet comes into play. So it's a four to three road diet where you have, currently we have um, two lanes in each direction. And the plan is to go down to one lane in each direction with a turn lane in the center. Mm -hmm. and so that obviously opens up some real estate for sidewalks and for, for bicyclists. Um, so a lot, a lot of exciting stuff happening there. And then there's also really a pretty thoughtful network of paths and other connections throughout town to make it a complete network. So they're actually just constructing a path between the Lihui Civic Center and our convention hall downtown that's um, almost complete now. That will allow people to move across town without really having to, you know, use the streetscape because this is kind of a go through a park and, you know, a, across some other spaces and really open it behind a school, so it really opens up some, um, some transportation opportunities to those who are not uh, behind the wheel of a large automobile. And have, have the planners gotten a lot of support from the business community? Because I know over here in Honolulu, when we start screwing around with streets and parking, the business owners go up in arms and say, you're taking away my parking, you're, you know, you're making my customers go away and stuff. But that, that's a different community over in Lehui. Are you having more support from the businesses there? So, you know, interestingly, and <laughs> I'm going to say it again, Ben. You know what I'm going to say. Our planning department has worked magic on this. They have, and, and, and our leadership has also. You know, they really do a tremendous job um, with community outreach. And there's some community advocacy groups, including a woman named Bev Brody, who heads up a group called Get Fit Kauai. Um, I don't know if you've ever met Bev, but she is a firecracker. <laughs> and... Um, so we, we do things, so for the past several years, we've had, we've had these things called the Rice Street Block Party. So we basically shut off the street for a night and have a big festival in the street. And um, everybody, including all the businesses, get out there and we have additional street vendors and, and it's really a big celebration in the town. And so it, it's an opportunity to talk about like this kind of shift that's happening and what we're going to be doing. Um, 
there's always some resistance. There's always some people that are hold out and think that the old way was better. But by and large, it's very well received, and I think businesses are very excited. Um, you know, there's a little brew pub in Lihui now that's been there for a few years, and they they are very much kind of our little model citizen in terms of having a little sidewalk space out of the brewery, and they're always participating in our community events. Um, there's some people that have done some great work in one of the parks right downtown, and they've really taken ownership of that and the improvements that are happening there right now. There's there's really a whole myriad of things that are happening. Last time we did the block party, one of our um, one of our community groups put together a, a, an artist exhibit. So they had street art and they painted this beautiful mural across one of the temporary construction fences uh, in front of one of the the buildings being renovated, and they did it live. So it was, this was at the block party. Everybody's watching and they're kind of watching these images come to life. It was pretty pretty magical. So. Tremendous amount of support, tremendous amount of work. Can't give enough credit to the people who have held this vision for so long. And as a resident of downtown Lihui, I live, you know, I live 500 yards from here where I'm sitting in my office, and it's, it's right in the thick of the project. I am very excited um, to, to see my neighborhood transform and really thankful that all the people that have contributed to it over time and, and just being able to be, be here to see it manifest. Well, next time we have you on the show, we'll make sure the planners are uh, invited too so they get to... It's some of the credit, but thanks for giving them some credit. I know they, they're, they're the kind of folks that are behind the scenes and don't ever get much recognition, but you're right. You know, city planners do an awful lot of thinking, and it, it takes an awful lot of work to get things through all the wickets that they have to go through to make them happen. So, yeah, we, we got to re recognize them and give them some credit. Um, yeah. How about the, the bikes? Uh, are you doing anything with bikes over there besides um, putting in more bikeways? Are there good rentals now and things like that? So there are definitely some great uh, rental shops. Um, mostly the ones that I'm aware of are on the, the east side along the path. They're certainly kind of the normal bike rental places around town that are, or around the island as far as kind of, you know, adventuring for tourists that want to go mountain biking. But specific to to com to um, transportation, like a uh, bike share, there's nothing yet. We're very interested in, and I guess what I would call shared use mobility broadly, you know, so it's it's a little tricky here because we don't have the population density you folks have over there with, you know, that beaky system that I love every time I come to Honolulu. But um, we are definitely looking under every rock and, and talking to community partners about how we can stand up um, some innovations in terms of shared use mobility, whether it be scooters or bikes or you name it, um, you know, car share, anything we can do. And the, And part of the discussion is, how do we how do we give tourists the choice so when they get off the plane at the airport instead of just renting a car for a whole week how do we give them the opportunity to consider going to their hotel on a shuttle and then just you know maybe they rent a car one day because they want to they want to go hola hola around the whole island but maybe the rest of the days they can just go into town rent rent a bike you know take a shuttle here take a shuttle there and really help help with a lot of the challenges that we have in our community and also have a great time and enjoy themselves without that not being saddled with having to park a car every second and put gas in it and all the things that come with it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it would take to get a beaky system over there. I do know that the foreign trade zone here, we have a whole bunch of bikes sitting there waiting to clear the foreign trade zone because it was one of those bike share programs that's uh, not like beaky. They just, they don't have any stands or anything. They're just the bikes. And I guess they're GPS tracked and things and you get your cell phone and you just jump on the bike and take it and then you drop it off and get charged a fee for however far you go or whatever. Anyway, they're, they're still negotiating with the city uh, over here, but uh, maybe they should be talking to you. I don't know if they have to have a certain number of bikes or whatever to make it worthwhile, but um, that sounds like a good opportunity. I'll, if I, I'll, I'll send that over to David Skick Inc. at the Foreign Trade Zone, see if those guys want to start talking to the county of Kauai about the bikes. <laughs> I, I think we have some of the similar <laughs> issues. As a matter of fact, I think there's some bills in the ledge this, this session that um, really start to define, you know, what these things are and where they go. You know, one of the things that, that I've heard from a lot of our planners that's kind of forefront in the foref in their forefront is we don't want total chaos on the street. So it's like designating spaces for them to park and, and, and understanding what the rules of the road are. Do they go on the bike path? Do they go somewhere else? Um, do they go on the sidewalks? And, you know, depending on what the device is. And those are really important questions. So. Yeah. Um, I think these are challenges that communities are working out all over the country, and I'm confident that we'll, we'll get it right. It's going to take a little time. Okay. We're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back with um, Ben Sullivan in a few seconds. And uh, 
spend a little bit more time talking about Kauai, uh, the utility over there, and um, what they've been doing, because they really are on the cutting edge of renewable energy being integrated into their, uh, their system, and they're way ahead of the rest of the state. So we'll catch up with Ben on that after the break. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming. Salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here on my lunch hour, as usual, talking to another government employee over on the island of Kauai, Ben Sullivan, who uh, does their sustainability and energy uh, coordinating for the county. And we haven't talked to him for about a year, and so we got him back on. And I'd like to spend the, the rest of the time talking a little bit about their public ut uh, electric utility. It's it's really a great model, and I know Ben, you know, talked about what they've done and where he started um, getting into the sustainability with the uh, electric utility over there. But um, they're, I think, close to fifty percent um, intermittent renewables, if I'm not mistaken. Is that about right, Ben? The only thing you have wrong, Stan, is I don't think they're called intermittent renewables anymore because they got all that storage that goes with them. So actually, um, we are we are over fifty percent, and the, it seems like the magic these days with the with the utility staff is to put in solar plus storage projects. And I think they've done let me see they've done two projects with a whole lot of storage, and they have a third one in the pipeline. And then prior to that, there's there's a number of other solar farms that had storage components but weren't quite load shifting. Um, they were just they were more uh, frequency regulation, as far as I understand it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, overall, amazing work. These projects are going in um, substantially less than the avoided cost of petroleum generation. So we are all very lucky as co-op owners to be um, on the receiving end of some of those savings, and also you know hitting hitting some of our goals as far as reducing our emissions and all the other important stuff that goes along with it. Yeah, I'm not sure if Hawaiian Electric takes your uh, island into account when they talk about renewable energy on the utility grids in Hawaii, but I think they're capitalizing off all the work that you guys are doing. But um, yeah, I mean, the, I tell people that stored energy is base, uh, you know, firm power. And um, you're right. So the intermittent, the solar and the wind and things like that, if you don't have energy storage, um, you just basically have a really tough to manage uh, grid stabilization problem. But you get enough storage on the grid and now you've got some firm power that you can your utility can use to flex up and down and the batteries are pretty pretty quick reacting so you know you can react to surges and stuff do you, off the top of your head do you remember about how big um of a generation load they have average for the day is it you know 50 megawatts so, or? so i think you know historically it's always hovered around 75 megawatts okay as a, as a peak as a system peak certainly <laughs> there's there's ups and downs and seasonal variations in that but that, that's an evening peak typically, so I think it comes up. And you no, know, I, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to speculate. I know. I know it's. You know, it comes up for maybe 40, 50 megawatts in the middle of the day, and then it then it peaks up in the evening, and then it comes back down pretty quickly. So actually, a lot of these recent solar farms. Um, my understanding from KIUC's engineers is they have been using them both to generate during the day, and as they as they kind of fill in the daytime space. As far as their available load, they've also been using the batteries to shift to the night to the evening peak. So they they store for you know a short period after the sun is shining, and they dump that energy into the evening peak. You know from day five to nine p.m. Yeah, the engineers that we have working on our Hickam microgrids, 
um, you know, it's, it's really fascinating to talk to them and see the challenge that they have um, to balance it, and Hawaiian electric engineers too. Um, it, yeah. It's not as easy as people think, especially, you know, when you have uh, unstable weather, clouds coming over, rain for three or four days in a row, um, the solar's not picking up as much energy as it, it, it would normally, and um, the batteries and other storage have a lot of work to do. And they don't just store energy, they help smooth out the power, they help uh, take shock loads that come in when some uh, a short or something or big big motors all kick in at once from big air conditioning units and pull a lot of amps out of the system. Uh, that storage is really important. So at 75 megawatts, it's, that's a pretty respectable. I'm sure the duct curve is real similar to Oahu's in terms of the evening peak. Um, there's, what's the plan? Is there, well, number one, is there any hydroelectric? Um, you know, you guys do have some waterfalls and some, you know, Waimea Canyon. Do you, do you have any hydroelectric at all? So there is some hydroelectric, and a lot of it is, is legacy <coughs> hydro, um, run of river, run of ditch projects that have been around for, you know, coming on 100 years in some cases and, and even a little bit more. Um, there is also some work that's being done um, with, with multiple parties, uh, I think especially on the west side, to either add capacity to existing projects or to actually put in new projects. So one of the projects KAC has been working really, really hard on, um, and I give them a lot of credit because they've been just hanging in for years and years and working with community and trying to work through the issues that are always challenging with regards to water access. Um, is that, you know, a, there's a pump storage proposal for the west side that they've been working really hard on. And so that, again, involves photovoltaics for generation, but it, instead of using batteries for storage in that case, you would use um, the water. So you right. pump the water uphill in the middle of the day when you were making energy with the sun, and then when you need it some other time, you, you let the water fall back down and you uh, run it through a turbine. That, that's a good um, segue into what I was going to bring up next, which is other than batteries, which kind of fall into, a, I would call, the lower power, lower, shorter duration storage, um, uh, storage systems, you have uh, up in the right corner where it's higher voltage and longer duration, you have pumped hydro, you have hydrogen, you have um, maybe even natural gas, uh, compressed air, believe it or not, is one of the options. Um, so you're obviously looking at the pumped hydro, which is basically maybe building a small reservoir, pumping the water uphill, and then running it back through turbines at night. Is, is uh, K KUC looking at anything like hydrogen or flywheels or anything else to be used for energy storage? So it's funny, Stan. I, I don't, um, this is going to sound crazy, but I don't talk to them as much as I used to because they're doing so well. We just, you know, our primary role here is to get out of their way. I'm also, you know, I'm, I want to mention I'm really lucky. One of the things that happens when you have a cooperative is that there's a natural cycling of board members through the community. So we, you know, we, it's, we've been a cooperative since 2002 of, of a member of the board of directors serves for three years and then they may run for re-election, but a lot of times they'll just serve for a term or two and then they'll just kind of go off and return to their normal routine. But those people become, you know, basically ambassadors. And what's really interesting is that we now have, we have our mayor who used to serve on the KIUC board in, in uh, Mayor Kawakami. We have Senate President Ron Kochi who used to serve on the KIUC board. We have myself, we have a number of other people positioned throughout the community who have a really solid understanding at least at a high level of how the utility works and what their constraints are. And I think it lends a lot of ability to them to be able to communicate and to be able to move on projects, you know, because they basically have allies who, to some extent, speak their language. Now, I, I want to be really careful. I'm not an expert in utility operations. I just had the privilege of learning from them for three years. But I think, I think that's, that's something that's maybe overlooked in terms of one of the benefits of a cooperative is that you get this pool, you, you build this, this kind of automatic base of resources in terms of your network, just as a function of bringing people through your board and having them learn and experience and understand in a very direct way what the challenges are and the constraints and all that kind of stuff. It sounds like maybe I got to get somebody from my office to come over there and, and meet with your folks and, uh, and talk to them a little bit about hydrogen storage because that would also help get uh, electric vehicles going on the island too and, uh, and help out in that direction. Amen, amen, Stan. Always, always happy to learn. We are very excited about electric vehicle opportunities. Actually, love to talk about, about that for a few minutes. Okay, well, well, we'll talk to my staff about that. Maybe we never seem to get to Kauai. We always seem to get to Maui or the Big Island, but 
but not Kauai. And um, I used to spend a lot of time on Kauai, so I'd, I'd like to get over there. Anyway, it's nice to have the corporate background. Um, and that brings up another question I had. With, with the folks that have, that have lived there their whole lives or lived there a good portion of their lives, um, and having the utility background now, does the um, utility seem a little bit more resilient to uh, the occasional hurricane or storms and, and um, floods and things like that that happen? I mean, are those things being built into the system now that you have people that are actually live, live there helping run the system? So um, you're getting into an area that's a little bit up above my pay grade, okay. so I, I want to be careful. Um, I, I, I know a little bit from being on the board, and you know, one of the things I know is that certainly the rebuild after Aniki um, created a lot of resilience, just in terms of how, when the when the, the grid system was rebuilt, it was you know rebuilt more solidly than it had been previously. And I do know also that they spend a lot of time thinking about you know impacts and resilience, and I, and and that goes all the way through. You know, they just went through that whole thing in, in April of last year with the floods, and and are constantly trying to improve their system. Um, I do know that they're, you know, they look very seriously at wind loading for the PV farms um, because obviously we now have a lot of our energy generation in photovoltaics, and so what happens in the next hurricane? But I think there's, you know, to some extent, there's a we don't know what's going to happen in the next hurricane because we haven't been through a hurricane and had five, you know, 20 megawatt PV farms as as vulnerabilities before. So um, we'll see. Uh, you know, I don't think they're going to. I don't think the panels are going to go flying. But you know, one of the a hurricane is basically a an extended period of, of large objects flying through the air, right? And the, and the large objects that run in, that kind of smash into your infrastructure are the things that do damage. Yeah. So, so who knows? Okay. Well, believe it or not, Ben, we've blasted through 30 minutes here already. And uh, I appreciate you getting us up to speed on what's happening out there in the western state of Hawaii and in the wild, wild west of Kauai. Say hi to all my friends in the, in the guard over there up on Mount, uh, on Koke. And... Um, and help, I hope you get to be on the show and bring some of your planners in the next couple of months. We'll get you on the show again. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Thank you, Stan. Okay, Ben. Aloha. We'll see you next time. And uh, for everybody out there, see you next Friday on Stan Energy Man. Aloha.